this morning we're going to go over the Leandro case a little, where it came from, where, where it currently stands. And uh, I may, I, I don't know how much Judge Manning can speculate, but I, I may be able to speculate a little bit on where it's going. And let me say before we start and before I forget it, that Judge Manning, uh, being an active judge and having this case before him, it is still an active case, uh, is, a, is much more constrained, I would say, in what uh, he can, what he can uh, say and give an opinion on than I. I'm, I'm off the bench now and pretty much uh, free to say about anything since I don't have a, <laughs> <laughs> since I can't prejudice anybody anymore. Uh, the Leandro case, uh, most of you probably know, but let me just review for you. The Leandro case was brought originally by uh, parents uh, uh, and educators in, in what is euphemistically called low wealth districts. I, why we have to use such mushy mess, I've never understood. Poor counties uh, and, and, and largely poor parents and, and uh, poor school boards and county commissioners. But what they, were, what they contended is that their children were not being uh, given an equal opportunity for an education. Nobody can pour it in your head and make you get it. But they, uh, so it's not a question of equal achievement, but theirs weren't getting an equal opportunity. Uh, and they uh, purported to show this um, in, in they alleged in the case, and they were trying to show it by the by the yearly aptitude tests uh, that the their yearly aptitude tests were lower than those in other in other counties. Uh, so for those of you teachers who don't like teaching to the test, if you don't have tests, you don't get any money. That's um, I think, but the legislature has now abolished a good number of them. But anyway, that was if they couldn't show that, then they then they had no case. If they couldn't show show those things, so it was very fun, the tests were very fundamental to it. Uh, they alleged that uh, that the state's participation was inadequate to um, to perform the function it's that it is given under the constitution of the state to provide a public, a free public education for the students of the state. And also that the funding system deprived uh, many of the districts because there is an equal, uh, there was an equal uh, opportunity, equal funding clause in the Constitution as well. Well, the case came before us and, and I, I, as Chief Justice, uh, all of my colleagues where it started, they started dodging for the doors and, and telling me, well, this is a Chief Justice's sort of case. And, uh, <laughs> and it was. I mean, I couldn't argue with that. And, you know, one of the good things about, uh, maybe one of the only good things about being, getting old is that you have some experience and points of reference. I knew when we got into this that we were, that we were taking the top off of a beehive. Uh, I had spent my earliest days as a lawyer in the implementation of, Brown, of a U.S. Supreme Court case, Brown against the Board of Education, working with Judge Manning's father on that. Uh, and it took uh, about 30 years and still isn't, we're still not done, but it, it, hammering out what it meant practically on the ground hearing all the objections to why things couldn't be done, all the resistance of legislators uh, all over the country, uh, was a long, tedious, wearing task uh, that I'm not sure Earl Warren and the U.S. Supreme Court understood when they jumped into it. But anyway, I had that background. At the same time, though, when, uh, that made me cringe and say, like, we, we really ought not to get in this. At the same time, I had the personal experience of having gone to school in what was then, I guess maybe still is, a very poor district, a very poor county in the state, Beaufort County, where 
the original Washington is, as we call it, not, not little Washington. And it was the original Washington. But I, I, was, I was in school down there, and, and in the third grade, I was going to school in one of those Depression-era schools. They're all exactly the same. Had, had steps going up all four sides, wide steps, all made out of brick. Exact same, uh, same building plan. Uh, so you could have been in one county as well as another. And, but but I, I wound up as a third grader being the, the uh, special ed teacher for the school. I, I, could, I was the best reader in the third grade. So the teacher, we had, and we had three little children in there who were slow. I don't know what the appropriate term is nowadays, retarded intellectually challenged. In those days in eastern North Carolina they were called little morons, which is, which is definitely not the term to use anymore. And for you Yankees that moron is a moron. Uh, but, but anyway, I, I sat out on the steps in my little Opie Taylor t-shirt in the broiling sun with my three little students and tried to help them, help them read. And that's all, that's all the special ed there was in the Beaufort County, uh, in, in, the Washington, in the Washington, North Carolina, which was the Beaufort County uh, Public School. So I had that background. I knew things weren't, weren't the same everywhere. You know, I, didn't need, I didn't need a bunch of lawyers from Raleigh telling me that. But so, so we got into the case, and what had happened was the case went before uh, Judge Maurice Braswell, Morris Braswell, who uh, is one of the best Superior Court judges we ever had. Uh, and uh, he said, and, and the state uh, and the, made them a motion to dismiss saying that the complaint, there was no right, so the complaint failed to state a, a claim that the courts could recognize. Judge Braswell overruled him and said, yes, there is a right. Uh, to a public education, and this suit may go forward. Well, it went over to the Court of Appeals, and they reversed Judge Braswell. And what they said is, there's a, the, it's true the Constitution has a right to a public education, but all, and, but all that means is the state has to have a, have a school system. It doesn't say anything about the qualitative aspect of it. In other words, are they actually learning anything? It's just you got to have a building there. It's got to be open some regular times, <laughs> and there's and there should be a teacher there, I guess. But it, but <laughs> but it but I mean but but that, that what they said what, and basically what they were saying is that this is what we in what in the profession is called a non-justiciable issue. It's just not something courts get into, and you hear a little of that nowadays uh, as we've gone forward with this case. But it came to us, and the issue for us, the uh, first issue was, is there a constitutional right? And if so, is there a substantive aspect to it? In other words, must, uh, in, in order to meet that need, must the state, uh, must the state's children uh, be given an opportunity to really learn and to go, go ahead to college or into professions and so on? And then the second part was, uh, if, if there is, do, do all these schools have to be funded the same? Well, we, we, uh, th we held that there had to be, that there had to be a, uh, that there was a substantive, uh, was a substantive aspect to this, and that there, there, the education had to have some qualitative content. And here's what we said that um, uh, when I waxed eloquent here, it says, uh, we answer the question in the affirmative and conclude that the right to education provided in the state constitution is a right to a sound basic education, period. An education that does not serve the purpose of preparing students to participate and compete in society in which they live and work is devoid of substance and constitutionally inadequate. So that answered the question 
about wh whether there had to be some content uh, to, to the thing.